Hey guys, it's Cass. Welcome to the first video of 2023 where we're going to talk about my, I guess like reading challenge I'm going to do for 2023 because my biggest goal with reading this year was to slow the F down and stop trying to achieve these goals. My life doesn't work that way. I can't read all the time. I'm a very mood based reader where all I want to do is read for weeks and then I'll go through weeks of not even touching a book. So <laughs> I needed something that was more toned down for me. Um, in 2022, I pushed myself to read 61 books. I mentioned this kind of the last video of 2022 um, that I possibly would have DNF'd quite a bit of them if I didn't push myself to meet this goal that I set for myself that no one was holding me to besides myself, I guess. But um this year my goal was 24 books and i'm doing a challenge for myself i guess um i just thought it would be fun i thought of it one day went on goodreads i had five book credits and almost every single one of these books um, five of them were free and the other were all under six dollars so i think i have it's like an affiliate code i think you get points or you get a free book and i get a free book if you sign up with it um with thrift books but this is my challenge of doing or reading one book every month that has the month's title the month's name and the title i guess is the best way to say it so i don't know anything about any of these books i have heard of literally none of them <laughs> so let's let's just see what happens we'll read synopsises and go from there so what I did was I ended up going onto Goodreads and literally typing in January and February and March and every single one and I didn't spend a lot of time. I, you know, some of them like summer months, I think it was like June and July had a lot of like more, a lot of them had a lot of history based ones. But I stuck within, a lot of them have like hundreds of book options with that in the title. Um, to narrow down my search to make it quicker, I kind of just went based off of how I felt about a cover um, on Goodreads. And I will admit that some of the covers that I liked on Goodreads are not the editions or the covers that I actually received, which sometimes that can happen. I think unless you go in and be like super specific about the edition or the specific book cover that you want. Sometimes I think they just kind of send you whatever since if it's about the book, the book's the same regardless of the cover. Um, however, <laughs> I buy with my eyes with books and everything about me is related to color and art. So some of these I'm a little disappointed in the additions I got, but you know what? We're still here. We're still going to do it. And without further ado, let's jump into January. The very first book is one that I have seen, I think, around on Goodreads over the last year. Again, I don't know when this book came out. I feel like it was fairly recent. Um, one of the quotes on here was from one who, the author of The Hazelwood, and I remember reading that book. So I think this one came out in May of 2020. So this one I've heard about, but I think it's just because it's a more recent book but this one is called the ten thousand doors of january by alex harrow um i know nothing about this book i think this is kind of what spurred and started the whole challenge in my mind because i actually got this and i think i had it if i can find it in one of the book hauls that i did early early 2022 um or maybe even late 2021 and i haven't read it um, or I bought it from thrift books in 2021 and then I talked about it in 2022 and I haven't read it I was going through my TBR pile, which I have like 30 books in there um, And I saw this and I was like, hey January, I need to read this in January um, And then I was like, let's do a whole challenge thing. Anyway, that's how it came about Let's see if I can even find a synopsis. There's a little tiny one on the back um, Oh She's also, I only see it by looking at this, she is also the author of The Once and Future Witches, which I also have downstairs and have not read. So, I guess that's good to know. So I have more than one book by her. But, 
The synopsis of this is, as the ward of the wealthy Miss Lo Mr. Locke, January Scaler, I think, Scaler feels a little different from the artifacts that decorate his sprawling mansions, carefully maintained, largely ignored, and utterly out of place. But when she finds a strange book, one that tells a tale of secret doors of love, adventure, and danger, for the first time, January realizes she can escape her story and sneak into someone else's. I think I had read the synopsis of this when trying to decide when I was buying this book originally, because um, I'm trying to expand my genres, which we'll kind of cover here, um, and that's kind of the reason I really didn't dive too deep into any of these books before I picked them. I just wanted to go based on feeling and look, um, and that's to push me to read different genres, because I don't totally really know what I like. Um, there is some romance in here, but my only ex- like ex- the only way I've been exposed to romance is through Colleen Hoover, and that is not romance, that's abusive relationships, so I've always given that a, a big, big thumbs down. Um, so I'm getting ahead of myself, but there's some romance in here. Anyway, this sounds extremely interesting. I love the- I don't know what you would classify it as, with the way the book pages are like ripped. Um, so I'm actually going to be starting this right away. Uh, I do plan to read at least one other book or two in conjunction with this, but my goal for the year, like I said, is 24, and this consists of 12 right here, so yeah. Thousand, ten thousand, the Ten Thousand Doors of January by Alex Harrell. I'm really excited for this. The next one is called February Flowers, and this one felt obvious to me because, hello, one, it says February in the title, which was a must, and the second one is flowers. And if you've been around since any part of 2021, I work with flowers, my job is flowers, I love the language and the meaning of flowers, and have kind of continued to dive into that. I find it extremely fascinating from the Victorian era, so this was kind of like a easy, easy, no-brainer. <laughs> so, the synopsis of this is set in modern China, February Flowers tells the story of two young women's journey of self to self-discovery and reconciliation with the past. 17-year-old Ming and 24-year-old Yan have very little in common other than studying in the same college. Ming, idealistic and preoccupied, lives in her own world of books, music, and imagination. Yan, by contrast, is sexy but cynical, beautiful but wild, with no sense of home. When the two meet and become friends, Ming's world is forever changed but their differences in upbringing and ideology ultimately drive them apart, leaving each to face her dark secret alone. Insightful, sophisticated, and rich with complex characters, February Flowers captures a society torn between tradition and modernity, dogma and freedom. It is a meditation on friendship, family, love, loss, and redemption, and how a background shapes a life. Which, does that not sound amazing? Because it sounds amazing to me. So, again, I'm probably going to say this for everyone, extremely excited for this, um, and I can't wait to give it a whirl. The cover on this, this is peeling off, and it kind of is taking, that's one thing that I don't like about some stuff with Goodreads. Um, this was clearly an edition that came from a library, because it has, um, I'm blanking on how you code things in a library. This tag here, but it's falling off, and then it's taking parts of the actual book kind of with it. Um, I feel like this was V and J Gordon Memorial Library is where this one is coming from. I'm always so curious as to how most of the books that I have received from thrift books, um, this is another great example. The one that I still have sitting here when I reviewed it was uh, Cassandra Speaks. It's King County Library from um, Washington. I'm always so curious as to like how many of these books from the library system end up on thrift books and is it really that common? Is that why I'm getting so many of them? Is that most of them do the libraries just like retire their books or get new ones? I'm not sure. I digress. Moving on to March. So for March is literally just called March a Novel by uh, Geraldine Brooks. It's the winner of the 2006 Pulitzer Prize. Um, this is not the cover that I saw on Thrift Books when I ordered it, but I'm not mad at this one. Um, let's read the synopsis. Okay, so the synopsis for March is, um, 
As the North reels under a series of unexpected defeats during the dark first year of the Civil War, one man leaves behind his family to aid the Union cause. His experiences will utterly change his marriage and challenge the most ardently held beliefs from Louisa May Alcott's beloved classic Little Women, which I've also never read. Uh, Geraldine Brooks has taken the, the, taken the character of the absent father, Mr. March, who has gone off to war, leaving his wife and daughters to make do in mean times. From vibrant New England to the, from the sensuous antebellum South, March adds adult resonance to Alcott's optimistic children's novels, a, lush, a lushly written, wholly original tale steeped in the detail of another time. March secures Geraldine Brooks' place as a renowned author of historical fiction. So, this is going to be a new genre for me. I have continued to say on here, I'm not a fan of reading about war or anything related to war. Um, it's just, I don't like the topic of war, so it's just not that fascinating to me in context of history, which I understand and recognize the importance of it in our life. Um, and how it's kind of gotten us to places where we are. I just don't prefer to read about it. So the fact that this is a historical fiction book um, and it's a penguin copy of it, um, I'm interested. I'm curious to see, you know, what I think about it. Uh, let's see, this came out in, this came out in 2006. Obviously it won the 2006 Pulitzer Prize. So again, very excited about this honestly probably one of my first at least as far as i'm aware i'm not very good at i'm not very good at grouping books into genres um i just kind of know things as fiction and non-fiction and i've not really gotten more detailed than that um so as far as i'm aware this might be one of my first real big trips down a historical fiction book kind of avenue for April, this one, if the size doesn't scream romance to you, then I don't know what does besides the cover. <laughs> this is the standard romance novel size, and this is 100% not the cover at all of what I saw on Goodreads, which again, too late, we're here, here we are. Um, this is called Snow in April by Rosa Munde Pilcher, number one New York Times best auth selling author of Winter Solstice and The Shell Seekers. And I'm not a romance person, but I will admit I am kind of excited to read a book that could be actually romance done right, or maybe this is more adult, I don't know, mature romance. I have no idea. I am not versed in romance novels at all. Um, like I said, I've only really been introduced to them over the last year by trying to and hating, absolutely hating, two Colleen Hoover books. Um, that is not romance. Those are glorifying and idealizing to younger women uh, abusive relationships. And I will forever have that stance and I will fight you over it. So, <laughs> moving on. <laughs> Snow in April, let's read the synopsis. <laughs> when you read a novel by, I think I'm saying it hopefully correct, Rosamund Pilcher, you enter a special world where emotions sing from the heart. A world that lovingly captures the ties that binds us to one another, joys and sorrows, heartbreaks and misunderstandings, and glad perfect moments when we are in true harmony. A world filled with evocative, engrossing, and above all, enjoyable portraits of people's lives and loves tenderly laid open for us. Um, but it says, Carolyn travels to Scotland, hoping to make contact with a brother she hasn't seen for years, and return in time for her wedding to a man her strong-willed stepmother thought so suitable. Then a sudden snow strands her in an isolated house with a young man recovering from tragedy. Both are on the brink of terrible mistakes, but perhaps they can save each other. And it's like, can anything, anything be more romance-specific setting? I don't think so. So that's for April. For May, this one is called May Bird and the Ever After by Jody Lynn Anderson. This is just book one, and if I'm not mistaken, there are three books in the series, and I'm kind of hoping that I love, I 
am pretty confident this is a middle grade, I believe, um, which I'm not against YA or middle grade or any kind of books like that. I actually find them really fascinating. Um, so I'm kind of hoping that this is good and then I can get the other two to continue this. But apart from that, synopsis, let's go. Um, most people aren't very comfortable in the woods, but the woods of Briary Swamp fit May Bird like a fuzzy mitten. There she is safe from school and the taunts and teases of kids who don't understand her. Hidden in the trees, May is a warrior princess and her cat, Somber Kitty, is her grave guardian. Then May falls into the lake. When she crawls out, May finds herself in a world that most certainly does not feel like a fuzzy mitten. In fact, it is a place few people living have ever seen. Here towns glow blue beneath zipping stars and the people, people walking through the walls. Here is the book of the dead. Here the book of the dead holds the answers to everything in the universe. And here, if May is discovered, the horrifying evil Beau Cleville will turn her into nothing. May Bird must get out fast. Um, so book two is called May Bird Among the Stars. So this is for May and I honestly feel like it's a really good feeling kind of cover book for <laughs> for leading into summer so actually really really excited for this one she says about every book the next one is for june and it's called a million junes by emily henry author of love that spit the world um i did get this on thrift books at the same time but i do think it's interesting that it was apparently i I'm kind of shocked that they wouldn't peel that off. Um, it's It was $3.29 at Goodwill at some point for someone. Um, again, this book I know nothing about. It says, beautiful, lyrical, and achingly brilliant by BuzzFeed. <laughs> I don't think that's a good sign. Um, let's see, this one came out in 2017. I think this is kind of the synopsis on the inside because the back just has reviews. It says, for as long as Jack June O'Donnell has been alive, her parents have had only one rule, stay away from the Aunt Angert family. But when June collides quietly, quite literally, with Saul Angert, sparks fly and everything June has always known is thrown into chaos. Who exactly is this gruff, sarcastic, but seemingly harmless boy who has returned to their hometown of Five Fingers, Michigan, after three mysterious years away. And why has June and O'Donnell to her core never questioned her late father's deep hatred of the Angert family? After all, the O'Donnells and the Angerts may have mythical legacies, but for all the tall tales they weave, both, family, both founding families are tight-lipped about what caused the century-old rift between them. As Saul and June's connection grows deeper, they find the magic ghosts and koi Koi was of five fingers seem to be conspiring to reveal the truth about the harrowing curse that has plagued their bloodlines for generations. Now June must question everything she knows about her family and the father she adored, and she must decide whether it's finally time for her and the O'Donnells before her to let go. So I gotta be honest, as I always am, this does not sound interesting. So we shall see. I think the reason I picked this one because when you type in June and July, a lot was just a lot of like war kind of historical fiction related things. And since I already got that, I didn't want to get another specific one aimed at that. Um, so far, this is the one I'm least looking forward to. So A Million Junes by Emily Henry. Up for July is July, July by Tim O'Brien. Again, I know nothing about this. Uh, New York Times notable book. Um, <laughs> let's just jump into the synopsis of this. At the 13th reunion of the Darton Hall College class of 1969, 10 old friends join their classmates for a summer weekend of dancing, drinking, flirting, reminiscing, and regret. Why would you go into anything hoping for regret? That's kind of stupid. Um, <laughs> the three decades since graduation have brought marriage and divorce, children and careers, hopes deferred and replaced. Hello, that's everyone in life. July July tells the heart-rending and often hilarious story of men and women who came into adulthood at a moment when American ideals and innocence began to fade. These lives will ring familiar to anyone who has dreamed, worked, and struggled to keep course, 
take toward a happy ending. With humor and a sense of wistful hope, July July speaks directly to the American character and its resilience striking deep at the emotional center of our lives. So, again, probably not something I would actually normally pick up, but most of these are really small, quick reads of probably under 300 pages. So most of these should be pretty easy and doable to keep on track with my goal. So July, July, I'm iffy about. Doesn't sound awful, but not as good as everything from May before that. For August, we have Light in August. That was kind of hard to read. Light in August by William Faulkner. Um, I've heard of the author, don't know anything about this book, just like everything else. Synopsis, let's go. Uh, first, let's just talk about William Faulkner. was born in 1897 in Oxford, Mississippi. Uh, <laughs> okay, okay. So on here, it has a quote by him where it says, Read, read, read. Read everything. Trash classics, good and bad, and see how they do. Just like the carpenter who works as an apprentice and studies the master, read. You'll absorb it. Then write. If it's good, you'll find out. If it's not, throw it out the window. Which, honestly, great quote. Um, Light in August, a novel about hopeful perseverance, features some of Faulkner's most memorable characters. Guileless, Dauntless, Lena Grove, in search of the father of her unborn child. Reverend Gail Hightower, plagued by visions, and Joe Christmas, a desperate, enigmatic drifter consumed by his mixed ancestry. No one ever put more of his heart and soul into, into the written word than did William Faulkner. If you want to know all you can about that heart and soul, the fiction where he put it all, it's still right there. And I, that's kind of all it really gives. Then there's like other things other people have said about him. So this is labeled as fiction literature. Um, like I said, I've heard about Faulkner. I've never read anything by him. Wow, he's written a lot. Here's all the books by him. Copyright 1932, renewed in 1959. I didn't know anything about this book, so it seems a lot older than I thought it was. And again, not something I would probably pick up on my own. I'm expanding my reading. And I agree with this quote back here that says, read everything. So here we are reading everything. The book for September is called The Last September by Elizabeth Bowen. Uh, I feel like I've heard of this author before, but I'm not sure. Um, synopsis time. The Last September is Elizabeth Bowen's timeless portrait of a young woman coming of age in a brutalized time and place where the ordinary, ordinariness of life floats like music over the impending doom of history. Damn, that's a good way to categorize life. In 1920, at their country home in County Cork, Sir Richard Naylor and his wife, Lady Myra, and their friends maintain a skeptical attitude towards the events going on around them, but behind the facade of tennis parties and army camp dances, all know that the end is approaching. The end of British rule in the south of Ireland, and with it the demise of a way of life that has survived the centuries. Their, their ward, Louis Farquhar, attempts to live her own life and gain her freedom from the dying class her elders vainly defend. The last September depicts the tensions between love and the longing for freedom, between tradition and the terrifying prospect of independence, political, sexual, and spiritual. Which, again, not something I would normally pick up, but that sounds really good, and this is a really, really, really short book. Again, under 300 pages. So this is also fiction literature, so... Again, not the cover on these last several. These were not the covers, you know, when I picked them, but I guess you have to be more specific, which is fine. Um, but this seems to be written back in 1920. So, expanding. For October, this one is called The October Country by Ray Bradbury. Um, it was a dollar twenty-five when it came out. There was a thing on here for a dollar. So it looks like a dollar cash, like someone had at a yard sale or something. And I got it on thrift books, I think, for free. Um, but I think it was like around two or three dollars. Um, this is tiny. This is the cover that I picked. Something about this is very interesting. I obviously see a face of a person, um, and then a tree with a house and a field. Um, so, 
Uh, this makes me a little nervous because it says science fiction, which is definitely not my genre, but let's move into <laughs> the synopsis. There are some who would dispute the statement that Bradbury is the uncrowned king of science fiction writers on the grounds that what he writes is not science fiction. <laughs> the dispute seems irrelevant for, say, the Saturday Review. There is no getting around it. He is, this is kind of just a rave of him. Um, anyway, he is a superb teller of stories with an offbeat imagination, a, fidu fis a fecundity of invention. I don't know that word. I need to look that word up. Fecun fecundity, the ability to produce an abundance of offspring or new growth, fertility. I've never heard that word before. Okay, so a fecundity of invention that he uses in all yield, all fills to write something that will hold you and delight you, or according to the Time Magazine, Bradbury's alpha fantasy is obviously only one element in a larger talent that includes passion, irony, and even wisdom. So whether one wants to give it a label or not, one thing is clear, whatever it is, Mr. Bradbury writes, it's a joy to read. So that didn't really give me a synopsis or anything about this. Um, there's actually pictures in here. Wow. One thing that's also interesting about this is this says the book exchange from Hickory, North Carolina. Where do these books come from? So I really don't know anything about this book. Um, I guess I could look it up on Goodreads, but I think we'll save that. I think I think we'll save it and just kind of go into it kind of not knowing anything. Moving into November, this is called November of the Heart by Leviral Spencer. Spencer Leviral? Leviral? Oh gosh. If this doesn't date the book, I don't know what does. Um, this is the cover that I saw. Taking that off. Just a nice gray book with a black spine. Oh my gosh. It smells like my grandma's house. Oh, it's so weird. Okay. <laughs> Let me put this back in its sleeve and then we will read the synopsis. Wow, and then here it has somebody's address. I might have to write to them. It's a ruby. It was kind of behind this little cover. I'm not going to show it to you, obviously. But it has a Kansas address. I might have to write out to them. I might have to. I just might have to. I probably will. I'll do that in November. <laughs> okay, so this one said, from the enchanted pen of, I'm going to mess up her name, Laverell Spencer comes a luminous and evocative tale about a man and a woman born into radically different stations in life who challenge the unwritten rules of Victorian society. So, Victorian society. In just a few short years, Laverell Spencer has emerged as a super selling, selling storyteller in both hardcover and paperback. Uh, la la la. It's just talking about her. Um, New York Times bestseller list with each successful book. Now in her powerful new novel, November of the Heart, Spencer displays an ambitious richness and death that will distinguish the sen sensuous and wise saga of her crowning achievement. Set at the turn of the century, November of the Heart tells of Lorna Barnett, a young woman from a wealthy St. Paul family, and Jen Harkin, Jen's Harkin, the ambitious dreamer who works in the kitchen of her family's summer estate. Lorna's father, Gideon, an avid sailor, is determined to claim victory for his own white bear yacht club in the next summer regatta. Having recently suffered defeat at the hands of the rival club, Gideon is willing to do almost anything to win back the prizes he sees as his. Jen's pressed into service as a waiter at an elegant family dinner party overhears Gideon's lament and is sure his boat building skills can be put to use on behalf of his employer. Brazenly crossing the boundary between servant and master by offering to design and build a boat that is for sure to win the race. This sounds so fucking boring. <laughs> Jen incites Gideon's ire, but piques his interest too. With Lorna's help, he convinces Gideon to finance the project. Gratefully for her in sorry, I'm reading really fast. Intervention, yet wary of jeopardizing his chance to build a boat of his dreams, Jen's nevertheless is power powerless in the face of Lorna's growing interest in the boat and him. So basically a romance. 
He soon finds himself eagerly awaiting her visits to the boat shed and starts teaching her about the craft of boating as well as the craft of love. Ooh. Despite the rigid caste system, which keeps them apart, Lorna and Jens are drawn ex inexorably together and been begin an affair as fresh and innocent as the summer itself, but the repercussions of their passionate idols soon separate them against their wills, forcing them through buried scandal and shame to endure a loneliness where it's always November of the heart. With its color colorful background of the Victorian yachting scene, November of the Heart is universal in emotion and glorious in description, character, and event. It's everything that Laverell Spencer's countless fans could desire and more. So, this came out in 1993. This sounds so boring. <laughs> oh, I'm judging it too harshly. Clearly a romance. I don't, I love the Victorian era, so maybe that'll do something for me, but the yachting scene, not something I think I would ever care about. Okay, and last but certainly not least, we have December, which is called Wild Decembers, which is not the cover, and I thought I went for, this is not the cover I saw. I also believe I picked a soft cover, not a hardback, um, but this is by Edna O'Brien. This is a novel. Um, let's, like everything else, jump. What does the actual book look like? I'm a sucker for that more than anything else. The book itself is a really pretty, like, mint color. Okay. <laughs> this first sentence doesn't have me excited. It was the first tractor on the mountain, and its arrival would be remembered and relayed the day, the hour the, of evening, and the way crows circled above it, blackening the sky, fringe, soundless. Augering. Okay, Edna O'Brien's masterly new novel Wild Decembers charts the quick and critical demise of relations, relations between Joseph Brennan and Mick Burglar, the, warning son, the wearing sons of wearing sons, okay, in the countryside of Western Ireland. With her inimitable gift for describing the occasions of heartbreak, O'Brien brings Joseph's love for his land to the level of his sister, Bree Breeges love for both him and his rival Bulger. Ooh, these names are gonna be a bit. <laughs> Breeg sees the the wrong of years and the recent wrongs fuel each other as Bugler comes to claim recently inherited acreage of what her brother calls My Mountain. A classical drama ensues involving the full range of human bonds and betrayals and <laughs> leavened by the human comedy of which Edna O'Brien rarely loses sight. A dinner dance in the local village and the seduction of Mick Bugler by an eager pair of uninhibited sisters rival Joyce as their hectic exuberance. But as the narrative unfolds, the reader is drawn into the sense of foreboding in a place where fields mean more than fields, more than life, and more than death to what the fuck is this book? <laughs> I think everything pre May and so basically January to May sounds like I can get into it. Sounds like it's up my alley. Um, and I guess maybe the bigger, uh, like not struggle, but challenge in this is towards the latter half of the year, which is going to be very interesting to push myself to read these because this does not sound exciting. Your lot your yacht love Victorian romance does nothing for me. I have no idea what this book, this guy writes science, fi science fiction without writing science fiction. Very curious. This one is probably one of the only ones that sounds actually really interesting. So I digress, September, January to May, and then September I'm in for. Um, again, I don't know any of Faulkner's work, so that'll be new and interesting. This is not typically something I'd pick, nor is this, and neither of June or July's books sound very exciting at all. This sounds exciting. I hope this is good. This is for May, the Maybird, um, and it's a series, so looking forward to reading this and discussing it with you guys. April is hard and heavy romance, as romance as romance can get. March is interesting to me. Again, historical fiction, so this will be new for me, it feels like. 
this I'm excited for and this one I'm probably most pumped for, which is the 10,000 Doors of January, which if the September, no, if the November, if the October, November, or December books were up first, I'd be a little daunted of this challenge, to be honest. But because this is first, I'm going to peel it open, get started on it, and you guys will see me do some semi-like review of these every single month, but then I'll do a full recap at the end of the year. It'll be so interesting to review this at the end of the year where I'm in a different place, in a different time zone, probably looking different in a different setup. So. Cheers to 2023. Let's get started with the 10,000 Doors of January by Alex Harrell. And I'll see you guys in January's wrap up for reading. Bye.